We have a neat opportunity to support our students tonight. They're having a trivia night to raise money for, our, uh, for their summer mission trip. And if, if I were a less humble person, I would mention at this point that my team won last year's uh, trivia competition. And if I were a less humble person, I would bring the trophy to show you that, that we won. But that would be rude, so I won't do that. I'll... Uh, but, you know, one of the cool things about that trivia night is it, it reveals what's in our brains. And we have some random things that are in our brains. If you could look inside my brain, you would see the lyrics to every 80s song that was ever released. It's kind of a strange thing. If there's a trivia question tonight about the 40-yard dash time of any of the Chiefs' new draft picks, I'll, I'll be good to go. There's some random information in here. You've got some random stuff in your brain, too, as well. And it's interesting that the Bible tells us that God is interested in what is in your brain. Your mind matters to God. In fact, there are scriptures that say things like, you are to love the Lord your God with all your mind. He wants you to use your brain to love him, to adore him. There are scriptures that say things like, you will be made, you'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There are scriptures that say things like, have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus. He wants your mind to look like the mind of Christ. There's a scripture that says we are to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. God is interested in your mind. And we're going to explore that together this morning. So let's, for a minute, let's think about what we think about. Let's think about how we think and what we think about. And let's recognize, first of all, that God wants to give us a new mind. We're in this series of messages called New Day, and we're exploring the, the fact that God says, don't dwell on the past. Behold, I am doing a new thing. And we've been exploring a lot of the new things that God promises to do. He says that because Jesus died and rose again, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation, a whole new person. He gives us a new name. We're not limited by those old labels anymore, but he tells us who we are in him. We explored the fact that he brings new life to dry bones. He can cause dead things to come to life. We saw that he established a new covenant in Christ. We don't have to earn our way to him, but Jesus has paved the way by his death on our behalf. Last week, we looked at the promise that he gives us new mercies every single morning. God is doing a new thing. And one of the new things that he wants to do is to give you a new mindset. God wants to give us a new mind. Look at a couple of scriptures that make this point. By the way, we're going to be reading stuff from all over the Bible today. Uh, we'll have all the scriptures on the screens. If you want to look at a spot in your Bible, Romans 8 would be a good place to turn. We're going to land there for a few minutes in just a moment. But we'll have all the scriptures up here. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24 says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So that passage describes two different versions of you. There's the old you that's being corrupted. There's the new you that is aligned with God. And the thing in the middle, the thing that changes you from the old you to the new you is to be made new in the attitude of your minds. A new mindset is what transforms you from the old way to the new way. Here's another scripture, Romans 12, 2. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So again, it describes two different yous. There's the old you conformed to the pattern of this world, living the way the world lives. There's the new you in line with the will of God, aligned with him. And the thing in the middle, the thing that causes the difference is the renewing of your mind. So Ephesians 4 talks about having minds that are made new. Romans 12 talks about having our minds renewed. Both of those words come from a Hebrew word, that, or a Greek word, pardon me, that means to renovate. 
just like this physical space has been renovated, it has been transformed, God wants to renovate your mind. He wants to change the way you think. He wants to change what you think about. Another important biblical concept is that it's up to me where I set my mind. Think about it. You get to choose where your brain is pointed. You get to choose what books you read, what shows you binge, what music you listen to. You get to decide who you have a conversation with and where you get your news from and what websites you visit. And Colossians 3 verse 2 says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. That's a command because God wants you to know that you have a choice about where you set your mind. Now, there are a few things that will happen in the course of your day. Somebody might, a coworker might barge in and just start a conversation, and you didn't seek that out. That's some mental input you weren't looking for. You might drive past a billboard that grabs you that you weren't planning on thinking about that thing. But a whole lot of what goes on in your brain, you are choosing whether or not to put it there. We're commanded. We have the option of where we set our minds. You made a choice this morning. Maybe somebody chose for you and dragged you here, but most of you made a choice this morning to come to church, to come to a place where you would have your mind filled with the songs of worship, with the words of scripture, where you would have mental input from other believers in Jesus Christ. You made a choice about what you were going to, where you're gonna set your mind today. It's up to me where I set my mind. And here's the big thing. Where I set my mind shapes the direction of my life. The Bible says it's a really, really big deal what we put into our brains and where we focus our minds. Seeing all these graduates up here today reminds me of my high school days back while dinosaurs were still a threat. And back in the the mid-80s when I was in high school, I took a computer programming class. And that was back in the day when the space shuttle had less computing power than the, the cell phone in your pocket right now, you know, so computers were a little bit different back then. The one thing I remember from that computer programming class is G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. That's a, that was a saying that's attributed to an early IBM programmer named George Fuchel. And the concept is that if you are programming a computer and you put bad information into the computer, well, what comes out of the computer is going to be bad as well. If you're trying to calculate the average of a set of numbers and you misenter the numbers into the computer, well, you can't blame the computer for giving you the wrong answer. Garbage went in, so garbage came out. Well, that's not true only of computers. It's true of human beings. If we put good stuff into our minds, if we set our minds on healthy things, then there's a positive outcome in our lives from that. But if we set our minds on destructive things, we put junk in our brains, then that leads to a life that's a mess. So here's that Romans 8 passage I mentioned a moment ago. Romans 8, starting in verse 5 talks about two different contrasting ways of life that flow from two different sets of the mind. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. So we've got two different mindsets here, a mind that is set on the flesh. That's the Bible's word for just our basic human nature apart from God, the stuff that we tend to want and be obsessed about when we're apart from God, or a mind that is set on the spirit, on the spirit of God. And it's interesting that it starts with we set our minds either on those fleshly things or the spiritual things, but then we wind up being governed by the thing we set our mind on. We choose where we set our mind, but then our mind starts to be controlled by, led by, governed by the thing that we set it on. We choose to put our mind on earthly things, and then those earthly things take control. They lead us. They govern us. We choose to set our mind on spiritual things, on the things of God, and God has more and more sway over us, and he leads us and governs us. And there are two totally different outcomes 
of those two different choices of what we do with our mind. A mind set on the flesh, it says, the outcome is death. It destroys. There is literally no future in it. A mind set on good things, on God, on spiritual things, is life and peace. All the difference in the world. Some of you have met Dan Mears before. Dan Mears is better known as KC Wolf. He's the chief's mascot, and he's a super neat, committed Christian guy. And I've gotten to hear him tell a story a few times. And one of the analogies, the analogies he used one time really stuck with me. He said that your thoughts become your actions, your actions become your habits, your habits become your character, and your character becomes your destiny. So your whole, what happens in your life is a thing that is downstream of what you think about. Your thoughts lead to actions, which lead to habits, repeated actions, which leads to character, the accumulation of your habits, which leads to your destiny. It all starts with your thoughts. You can imagine a river, and if there is a a factory that's dumping pollutants into the river, that's going to affect things downstream. When you put bad stuff in up here, it affects everything all the way down the stream. You could even, if you find a river that is polluted, you know that what you need to do is go back upstream and look for the place where the pollution is coming from. Well, what Mears says, and I think he's right on to it, is that when we see a mess in our lives, when we see that our lives are not going well, we are not making wise choices, somewhere back upstream are some thoughts that led to actions, that led to habits, that led to character, that led to that outcome of our lives. A healthy life flows from a healthy mind. What you put in your gas tank has consequences for your car. That's why NASCAR drivers don't use the cheapest discount gas when they're at a race. What you put in your mouth has impact on your body. You probably don't want to eat a frozen burrito at 10 o'clock at night right before you go to bed. You probably don't want to eat five pounds of chocolate every day. If those are the choices you make, that's what you put into your mouth. It's not going to lead to high performance from your body. And likewise, if you fill your mind with junk, don't be surprised when the outcome of your life isn't really pretty because what enters your mind eventually shapes your destiny. So our scripture tells us that if our thought life is unhealthy, if we set our minds on the wrong things, if we're controlled by the sinful nature in what we think about, then not only do we choose not to obey God, but it's actually impossible for us to obey God. It says there in verse 7 that the, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. If our minds are not right, if our minds are filled with dangerous things, then even if we want to go God's way, even if we try to obey him, we can't do it. The the very wiring of our brains gets in the way. Psalm 10 verse 4 puts it this way, talking about a wicked person. It says, in all his thoughts, there is no room for God. We choose a path that leads to a brain that God doesn't have any input in anymore. So how do we change? How do we change our minds? How do we let God have access to our brain so that he can renew us, so that he can renovate our minds? I want to talk about three very practical steps we can take that will help God have access to our brains. The first is the habit of selective input. I will fill my mind with good things. This is a challenge to take responsibility for what we set before our minds. Paul makes this point in Philippians 4, verse 8. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about stuff that is good and true and excellent and praiseworthy and beautiful. Think about stuff that is healthy. That there are some things out there that are good for our brains, and we should seek them out. There are some things out there that are toxic for our brains, and we should keep them out. 
That means we've got to be careful about the mental input we allow. Now, some things that we might let into our brain, it's pretty obvious that they are destructive and evil and wrong and bad. Pornography, for example, it's pretty obvious that for all people everywhere, that is something destructive for us to allow into our minds. Some things are maybe a little more subtle, a little harder to identify as harmful. I think about your source of news, how you find out what's going on in the world. If your source of news causes you to live in despair, and if your source of news causes you to hate your neighbor, that's mental poison that you need to avoid. Then there are some mental inputs that maybe aren't necessarily always wrong for all people, but you recognize that at least at seasons of your life, they are harmful for you. Watching a reality TV show about remodeling houses, that might be, for some people, a nice diversion and it maybe prompts a little creativity, but for other people, it might just prompt envy and, and discontent. Well, know what it does to your mind and make a choice about whether to allow it in. Social media can be a wonderful thing that lets you stay connected to people who are far away and and share about good stuff happening in your life. It can also be the biggest comparison trap on the planet and can make you miserable for seeing what's going on around you. Know what effect it has on you and and choose whether or not you you let it in. Maybe even there's a, a digital fast for a season to kind of test what impact it's having on you. Ask God to help you know what needs to go, what mental uh, input you're currently experiencing that is doing harm and you need to let it go. But it's not enough to just keep out the trash. That scripture tells us in Philippians 4 that we are to think about positive things. We are to intentionally seek out things that are good for our minds. Set your minds on things above, the Bible says elsewhere. Set your mind on what is true and noble and good and pure and lovely and admirable. That includes scripture. That includes worship. We're going to talk about those things in just a second. But it's cool that actually Paul is not just talking about what we would consider churchy things or religious things here. He says whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is admirable. He's not telling us just to look at the Bible and close your mind to everything else. He's saying cast your nets widely for stuff that is true and beautiful and noble and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. Be on the lookout for stuff. Even stuff outside of church can be mentally enriching. There can be a a moving piece of music or a a thought-provoking novel, or you can just commit to learning something as, as a way to honor God, taking in new information. You can ponder a sunset or a flower. Pay attention to acts of love and goodness that happen around you, and let those things shape your mind, fill your mind with good things. So the habit of selective input is important. Paying attention to what we let into our minds, being intentional about blocking the destructive junk, be intentional about welcoming the positive, good, healthy stuff. Another habit that helps to change our minds is the habit of worship. I will fill my mind with God. What we do here on Sunday mornings is a part of renewing our minds. I love Psalm 77, verses 11 and 12. Kind of describes what we hope happens in here. It says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Eugene Peterson, who wrote the the paraphrase of the Bible called The Message, describes worship this way. He says, worship is the strategy by which we interrupt our preoccupation with ourselves and attend to the presence of God. Worship is where we take the intentional step of, I'm going to quit thinking about Blake all the time. I'm going to quit thinking about what I want, what I think I need, what I think I deserve, what I think other people think about me. I'm going to take my focus off of me and I'm going to intentionally put it on God. I'm going to pay attention to him. I'm going to give my mind. I'm going to set my mind on him, on who he is and what he has done. Deliberately choose to think about him. And that can happen in here on Sunday mornings, but it can happen all through the day, every day, wherever you are. You can intentionally keep calling your mind back to God to tell him thanks for a gift that he's given to you to call out a a trait of his that you see on display in the world around you, to intentionally worship him is an important part of renovating our minds, letting God 
renew our minds. One more habit that changes our minds is the habit of soaking in Scripture. I will fill my mind with God's truth. God's given us a remarkable tool for reshaping and rewiring and renewing and renovating our minds. Joshua 1.8 says, Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. That word meditate maybe scares us a little bit, but to meditate, another word, variation of that word is just to chew on it, to, to turn it over and over in your mind. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. A, a, again, we have this, this idea of a stream where at the end of the stream is a prosperous and successful life. It is a positive life. But up here at the beginning of the stream is meditating on Scripture, changing what we put into our minds. And there are lots of ways you can do this. I know some folks in here this right now are in the process of reading through the Bible in a year, which is a wonderful way to have the whole story of Scripture in front of you so that you lay that story along the story of your life and interpret your life by what you see God doing in Scripture. Another way to do that, though, is to just take a little bite-sized part of Scripture. Sometimes we get in a you know, we just try to check off our list, reading as much of the Bible as we can. The goal is not really to get through the Scripture. The goal is to get the Scripture through you. So maybe one way you could meditate on Scripture is pick one little verse, one little passage, and just stew on it all week long. Read it again and again. Turn it over and over in your mind. Scripture memory is another wonderful way we let Scripture renew our minds. Take a small passage or a verse or a phrase and memorize it. Commit it to memory. Jesus showed us that in, in when he was tempted by Satan during his temptation, his answer to all three of those temptations was to quote Scripture, Scripture passages that had become a part of his mental framework because he had them memorized. Maybe you could meditate on a particular affirmation of Scripture. Part of what gets in the way of our minds is we, we think incorrectly about who God is and who we are. And so if we take a phrase from Scripture and turn it over and over to remind us that you are more than a conqueror, to remind us that you are a child of God, that in all things God works for good. We had a cool little experience of this in our house this week. Sarah, our daughter, had had a little challenging week with a, a person at ballet school who was not being very kind to her, and it was really getting to her. And we read in one of our morning scripture readings, Isaiah 50, verse 9, which says, It is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who will condemn me? And it became for us a reminder that who cares what people are saying if God is with me and God is helping me. That verse goes on to say something that we got a little chuckle out of. They will all wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. So we had fun picturing that mean kid getting eaten by moths, but that was probably not. Anyway, the... the <laughs> The main point I was trying to get to there is that scripture became an affirmation for us that the sovereign Lord helps me. Who will condemn me? You can take a little bite-sized truth from scripture like that and just make it your theme for the day, for the week. Let it rewire your brain. Your mind matters to God. He wants you to love him with all your mind. He wants to give you a whole new mind renewed in him. And when you do that, it changes the whole destiny of your life. It changes the, from being a death-ending journey to a life and peace-ending journey. And we can cooperate with him as we pay attention to things that are good and noble and true, as we pay attention to scripture, as we worship him. I challenge you to pray this prayer with me today. Lord, make my mind new, governed by you. Pray that God will make your thoughts captive to him, that he will govern your mind, that he will help you make wise choices about where you set your mind, that he will help your thoughts to honor him so that your character, your destiny, can honor him. Pray that he will change your mind and in the process that he will change your life. Will you bow with me in prayer? God, your word has such 
practical impact on our lives and we can see evidence in our own lives and all around us of how what our mind is set on changes the outcome of things. Help us to follow your wisdom and set our minds on you and on things that you want us to to think about and change us from the inside out as a result of that. And God, as we move into this time of commitment, I pray that you will help us to say yes to you. Remove the obstacles and the excuses that would keep us from responding as you want us to respond. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.